Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are, whenever you may be listening. This is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two, episode number eight. I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge. And as always, I am happy to be with you. This is a very special and very exciting episode of Talking Audiobooks. Now I know what you're thinking. Casey, come on now. They're all special and exciting to you. You get to be the host and you've got to prop up your own work the best that you can. So you think they're all special and exciting. Perhaps you are correct, but this one is special to me in a very obvious way. It is the first time that I, as host of the show, am going to conduct an interview. If you have been listening to this podcast since day one, you'll know that my first appearance on the show was as a guest. Ken was the host, and he interviewed me back in December. Well, after that interview ended, I emailed Ken and I said, Hey, I have someone in mind that I think would make for a fantastic interview. And you know what happened next. Instead of interviewing them, Ken took a few months off, decided that maybe he would like me to host this podcast. And when he reached out to me with that offer, it was something that I knew from the minute that I read it, it was obvious that I had to do this. I couldn't pass up this opportunity. This has been basically a dream of mine. And when he made that offer, I remembered that I had made an interview recommendation and that interview subject has zoomed to the very top of the list. So when it came time to book the first interview, there was no other choice for me as far as the first person that I wanted to talk to. I think if you are a listener of audiobooks or if you are an author who is getting an audiobook published or you're a narrator looking to increase your profile, or you're a publisher and you have multiple audiobooks coming out that you want to get some attention, whatever your reason for listening to this podcast may be, I think this interview will hold interest to you. I'm interviewing Jess the Audiobookworm. You can check out her website at theaudiobookworm, that's all one word, dot com, or audiobookwormpromotions.com and if you listen to this interview you are going to hear all about the different promotional services she can offer you as an author, narrator or publisher and as a listener you can find out how to get some free audiobooks and be included on a blog tour maybe if that's your thing or if you don't have a blog you can still get some free audiobooks if you are willing to write honest reviews on websites like audible.com and Jess is going to tell you all about that so there's something in this interview for everyone I believe and the interview portion of the podcast is going to be our main focus for this week Uh, no fan feedback question we're just going to do the interview And then we'll come back with some extra stuff in the podcast to fill it out for the week. But mainly the interview is the thing. It's the main event of the show. And I was so happy to sit down with Jess and to conduct this interview. I had a lot of fun. I think she's a great guest. I think that you are going to see her love for audiobooks in her work on her website, but you're going to hear it in her voice in the interview as well. She has a passion for the books themselves, and she also has a passion for seeing that your audiobooks get promoted and get the attention that you want them to have, and she's going to tell you all about that in this interview. I want to make mention of a couple things before we throw to the interview with Jess. The first thing is that the podcast is now on TuneIn, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. 
So if you are interested in subscribing in any one of those apps, you can absolutely do so. Uh, you can enter the Talking Audiobooks RSS feed into apps that allow you to do that manually. That is http colon slash slash talkingaudiobooks.podbean.com slash feed f-e-e-d feed and if you enter that manually into your podcast catcher of choice you can subscribe to it in any platform that will allow you to manually enter those feeds and we're always interested in being added into more directories so if you have a recommendation if you're like hey why aren't you here or why aren't you easy to find here just let us know we want to make this experience as user friendly for everyone as we can the other thing i want to remind you of is to like our facebook page that's facebook.com slash talking audiobooks if you have already liked that page then you are entered into the july giveaway and our july giveaway as mentioned is four promo codes from audible.com you can use them to get any audiobook of your choice absolutely any of them four that's a good number you know that's july 4th is a big deal this month in the united states that's how we picked the number four to give away that's a good start to a series it's a trilogy plus one if you will whatever your frame of reference may be you can apply it to this and you can get four audiobooks and all you have to do is like our facebook page between now and the end of the month july 31st on july 31st at 11:59 p.m pacific time we're gonna freeze it out for this month we're going to put all the people that have liked the page up to this point in a hat. Maybe it's a digital hat, but we're going to do it. We're going to put all the names into a randomizer, and we're going to pop one out. And whoever pops out of that randomizer is going to earn four promo codes from Audible.com. Now, this is something that you got to use the Audible US version of the website to receive and if you have won a contest from us in the past 90 days uh, you're not going to be included in this one so that would exclude our june contest winner uh, but everyone else it's open to and who knows the next big winner of the talking audiobooks podcast audible credit giveaway could be you and all you have to do is head over to facebook.com slash talking audiobooks and like that page and if you have done it already like i said you're already entered you're golden and if you haven't done it already you have until july 31st all right well, with that bit of repetitive speak and saying the same thing over and over again which is repetitive speak out of the way we're going to go to the interview that i recorded with just the audiobook worm but before we do that Ken is going to tell you how to get a free trial of Audible.com exclusively for listeners of the Talking Audiobook Podcast. And once Ken has done that, I will be back and I will be joined by Jess the Audiobook Worm for an absolutely wonderful conversation. So here now is Ken and we'll be back with that interview right after this. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trobridge. And we are back, and this interview has been one that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. As I mentioned in the intro, this is someone who, after I was a guest on the podcast, I emailed Ken and said, you should really have this person on, and Ken instead decided to take five months off before leaving me to host the show. 
but we're happy to have uh, Jess the audiobook worm here with us today. Jess, how are you doing this afternoon? Hey, I'm great, Casey. Thank you so much for having me on. This is so exciting. Well, I'm glad to have you on because there has been no better friend of the show thus far and into the future. You've been a listener. You've plugged it on social media. You've helped us get uh, in other interviews and things like that. So I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. Yeah, so have I. So before we get into talking about your blogs and your promotions works and things like that, I want to talk to you a little bit about just you as an audiobook listener. And before we even get into that, why don't you give the listeners who maybe don't know you or haven't been to your website just a little bit of background information on yourself? Um, well, I am, like Casey said, Jess, the audio bookworm. That's my chosen alias. <laughs> um, I run the audiobookworm.com and my recent addition is audiobookwormpromotions.com. That's for my promotional services. Um, I started out just as a regular audiobook listener in 2014, which you know, it was only three years ago, so it doesn't um, sound like I had a lot of experience, but I have definitely made up for that by listening to, gosh, probably eight or more audiobooks a month uh, ever since I just kind of stumbled upon an audiobook one day way back in 2014. And, so uh, can we talk <laughs> about that for just a minute? Um, you say it's only 2014. That's Really impressive. Do you remember how you got into audiobooks in the first place or what your first book was or how you came across the genre? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, it probably echoes a lot of uh, other folks' experiences getting into it um, with the Audible free trial. I was just, you know, randomly going through the app store on my phone one night laying in bed and saw the Audible app and I thought, oh, I'll give this a try. And I, you know, did my 30 day free trial. The first book I listened to was Stephen King's um, 112263. I'm sure I have that book. Before, yeah, that was way before it was ever made into an audible, I mean, into a Hulu television show. Um, but yeah, that was my first audiobook and to this day it remains my favorite. I don't know if it's because it was my first or just because it, I had the good luck of, you know, having such an amazing book be my first audiobook. Well, you certainly did pick a, a good one and as you mentioned, that one has gotten some notoriety from being a TV series after that. But um you always remember your first, I think. So you started out in 2014 and you were listening to 11, 22, 63, and uh, you just kind of dove in right after that. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. It was. I, I was hooked after that. Um, and, you know, after listening to 11, 22, 63, I tried some others. I don't remember what they were now, but I know that they were sort of disappointing in comparison but I was still so taken just with the act of audiobook listening that I just I trudged on and then I found another gem and you know found something else I liked and one thing led to another and here I am. It all just sort of snowballed. Uh, were you much of a reader before that? I was. I've always been a, a regular you know bookworm <laughs> growing up as a kid and um, all I would say probably through middle school, maybe into ninth grade and then, you know, as I became a teenager and then a young adult, um, life just got in the way. I mean, again, I'm sure that so many people out there can relate to this, but, you know, you get older, you get busy, you know, if it's with a job or college or family, kids and things, um, and, and you just you don't have time for, for things that kind of seem extraneous at the time, like reading. It, it To me, it seems like a luxury that I just didn't have time for anymore. I couldn't fit it into my schedule. And audiobooks, um, I've said this before in blog posts, audiobooks opened a door that I thought had previously been shut for me. I thought that, you know, reading was just something adults with busy lives just had to give up. And audiobooks showed me differently. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've told this story before myself, which is that 
I listened to audiobooks on and off for years. Of course, my situation is a little bit different. They've always been a part of my life because I'm visually impaired. But when I really became um, an avid listener was in 2013. I was working at the public library here in town. I was doing digital conversions for them. And I had to wear a headset because when I was working on these conversions, I was using a screen reader. And uh, the screen reader would tell me what the scanner was doing and whether or not I was having any issues. But it was sort of a distraction to everyone who was also working in the back area. I wasn't out near the patrons or anything, but uh, it was distracting to the people working in the back with me. So the librarian asked me or forced me, depending upon your point of view, to wear headphones while I did it. And at first I didn't want to because... Wearing headphones isolates you from conversations that are going on and you don't necessarily feel like you're, you you kind of feel like you're set aside. But then I saw the blessing of it because I could start listening to podcasts or audiobooks as I worked. And it was uh, probably February 2013 when I really got into Audible Hardcore and and um, was listening to them at work. So I get the whole multitasking thing. Yeah, that I think that's a big draw uh, for a lot of people that I've spoken with. And podcasts seem to be sort of a gateway into audiobooks a lot of times. And um, it, I think that's a really big draw for audiobooks is the ability to multitask. Like, I, I'm always asked, um, you know, like, what do I do when I'm listening? Am I just sitting there listening or am I multitasking? I'm definitely multitasking. I'm working, I'm cleaning, I'm cooking, you know, I'm laying down, falling asleep at night. I'm always doing something. I can't just sit still. That's just not in my nature. So audiobooks fit in perfectly, you know, in my lifestyle. Yeah, and you brought up a good point, and it's something we've discussed before on the show about uh, podcasts being connected, and publishers are starting to see that, and some of them are releasing uh, audiobooks first as a podcast, and then they're going to compile it into a book. And there's been several like that. And um, it's just really interesting. And it, it hasn't really been a big surprise to me because I figure if you can listen to, say, a, a two hour podcast, you uh, are a prime candidate for a book, I would think. Absolutely. Most audiobooks, you know, are between. I don't know, eight and 12 hours long, would you say? So that's, you know, break that into two hour segments, especially if you're commuting. You know, if you have a 30 minute, an hour, an hour and a half commute each day, one way, and then you double that to come back home. And I mean, you can go through an audio book in two or three days. And now, of course, you know, back in the day, you were carrying around bulky cassette tapes and things like that. And then CDs, which were less bulky, but still abundant. And now you can just store a bunch of audiobooks on your phone or on your – I have a hard drive that fits in my pocket that probably has 1,200 audiobooks on it, and it's not even half full. Yeah, what I did was um, whenever I uh, upgraded to the new iPhone recently, I kept my old one. It's still activated and everything, and I just – I use it, I guess, like a, an iPod would be used. I just keep audiobooks on there. And I cleared everything else off to make more room for audiobooks. Now I have two cell phones. One of them only acts as a cell phone, though. But the other is just great for extra storage. See, now, if I had been smart last night, I would have made sure to have a book already downloaded on my phone or on my iPad because the power went out. And that is the one time when it's sort of difficult to listen to something if you don't already have it downloaded. Uh, when the power goes out or the, well, not so much with when the internet goes down because I have all mine stored locally somewhere, but when the power goes out and it was out for almost half an hour last night. So, um, I could have really, I should have taken my own advice and had a book on hand. So you're using an old iPhone as a, as an iPod for your audiobooks. It's a pretty smart thing to do, quite frankly. Your power was only out for a half an hour. Oh my goodness, Casey. Come to hurricane country. I'm in North Carolina. And last fall, when we were preparing for Hurricane Matthew, downloading a, like a whole slew of audiobooks was 
part of my hurricane preparation. <laughs> Batteries, well, bottled water, audiobook. Well, I would say you got the essentials in there anyway. So you started listening in 2014. Um, and according to your blog that I was looking at this morning as I was stalking you for our interview, um, you started blogging in, was it October of 2015 that you decided to launch the audiobook worm? Yeah, it started out on Tumblr. The audiobook worm has, gone, it has moved home several times. It started out on Tumblr in October 2015. I moved to uh, WordPress.com in January of 2016, and then I moved to uh, or self-hosted WordPress.org, where I am now, the audiobookworm.com, in, I believe, June of 2016. And somewhere in between that January and June, I met you. That's right. I was just going to say that. I remember your blog from the um, WordPress.com days, and I think that's when we first started talking, because if I recall... You talked about maybe doing some kind of review or something, and uh, it was at the time my dad was still kind of um, in the throes of his battle with cancer, and he just had a little bit of time left, or maybe it was right after he passed away, but um, I was just really busy at the time, and and I always filed it in the back of my mind that someday she and I are going to do something together. Yeah, I remember when I came across you and your site because I was so excited to find another audiobook blogger. As you know, there aren't many of us out there, you know, who exclusively review audiobooks. So when I saw you, I was like, oh, there's someone of my kind. And uh, I was just super excited to find someone who was an exclusive audiobook blogger. Since then, I've, you know, gathered a list of um, several others, but you were one of the first. Well, yeah, and I think I found you the same way. I'm trying to remember how it all happened, but, you know, the the website that I have isn't the first incarnation of what I was trying to do either. In fact, what you're doing now on your uh, the audiobook worm blog is pretty close to my original idea for an, an audiobook website where you would have reviews, of course, but then you'd have different... Uh, you have a thing on your website, which I want to talk a little bit about your uh, resource reviews. You've reviewed uh, different sources for people to get audiobooks from, such as Audible, Audiobooks.com, Scribd, TuneIn, and most recently, Playster are some of the ones that you've done. Uh, how long was it into your listening? You said you really enjoyed 112263 right away. How long was it into your listening before you said, now I'm comfortable knowing what I uh, like and don't like in on an audiobook to the point where I can express that in a review? Um, that's hard to say because, see, if, if I had known then what this was going to become and how much this was going to mean to me now, I would have journaled about it. I would have scrapbooked about it. I would have, you know, taken serious notes. But... I don't really remember. I think it was around the time that I started the audiobook form on Tumblr, so maybe October-ish of 2015. Um, I know a little bit before that I had begun reviewing on Goodreads because it was something that I had seen other people doing, and I thought, oh, I could do that. Um, because, you know, I, I'm the only audiobook listener in my family, especially then. I I'm, I'm, was the only one then. I guess I'm the only serious one now. I've gotten my mom into it a little bit, but I didn't have anyone to discuss things with and not just things about the story and the book itself, but the narration. Um, and when I like something, I have to share it. I want to shout it from the rooftops. And my family kept, you know, saying, Jessica, that's enough about audiobooks. So I took to the web and I started reviewing and then um, I decided to kind of organize my reviews and more formally, and, and that's how the website came about. And then um, it, everything with me just sort of snowballs. And that's how the resource reviews that you mentioned happened, because I thought, I wonder if I could review more than just audiobooks. And what I like about your uh, reviews is you actually have not only a scale, 
but you actually outline what it means to get, say, a four and a half star review as compared to a four star or a five star review. Yeah. Even for me, I find that a little difficult. Um, talk about that a little bit if you have anything to say about how that sort of developed in your head. And I even do quarter stars now. <laughs> I had to get even more specific. Um, I mean, I think everyone has their own rating system and what it, you know, what it means in their head, what three stars means to them might not mean the same thing to someone else. You know what I mean? So um, I just sort of defined my rating system and I really wanted to define it in a tangible way. Like uh, if I say something is four and a half stars, then I say that this is a book that I'm going to recommend to most people. If I say it's five stars, this is a book I'm going to recommend to everyone. If I say it's, you know, three and a half stars, it's a book that I might recommend to certain people if I, you know, know that they're interested in the certain or in that particular genre. So it's not just a, I loved it. I didn't like it. I liked it a little bit. It's a a more uh, realistic way to understand the rating system, I think. Yeah, and I think it it uh, helps the person who's reading the review to have some sort of idea. I wish I had sat down and defined for people who read my reviews what constitutes a five-star uh, review for me and so on and so forth like you did that was one thing that really jumped out at me the first time i read a review of yours there was i think it was in the sidebar you had your whole rating system from five all the way down and i thought that was really a handy thing for someone who was reading your reviews for the first time to sort of know where you were coming from yeah i you know what? i'm glad you mentioned that i need to move that back to the sidebar i really liked having it there too but then when I started with my promotional services, that got bumped uh, in favor of things related to my services. But now that I've migrated those over to a separate website, I have some room in my sidebar again. So I need to do that. What's the longest audiobook you've listened to? Oh, gosh. Um, 30. I don't know. How long is Outlander? 30 some hours, maybe 35 hours. OK, I was just I was just curious because, you know, for me, for a while, like the longer the book, the you know, the more apt I was to listen to it because I don't know what it was. There's just something about long books that I really uh, sort of dug, and now I'm actually okay with with ones that are much shorter. But um, for a while, long definitely had a had a great appeal to me. And you said you listened to on average eight books a month, right? About, but those aren't super long ones. Those are, you know, in the eight to 12 hour range, sometimes 15. Um, well, that would be it, normal. I yeah, would, it's I, I a really long, like whenever I was listening to the Outlander series, I had to make sure, see, I'm big on preparation. So I had to make sure that I had room in my listening schedule for those. And probably during those months, I might have only listened to five or six total audiobooks that month, but... That big audiobook counted for two or three, you know? Sure. Of course, we talked on the podcast a couple of weeks ago about uh, listening slumps and what happens if you finish something and you don't really know what to go to next or you just, for whatever reason, don't feel in the, in the mood. Do you have that kind of slump and... Uh, if you if you have gone through those, uh, how have you helped or how have you gotten out of them? Absolutely. I, I think everyone goes through those. And now I'm moving more towards preventative measures to make sure that it doesn't happen. Um, I don't just listen to one audiobook at a time anymore because of that, because I would have the book hangover after finishing it and I wouldn't want to start anything else and wouldn't know what to start. So now I've started listening to multiple audiobooks at a time. That way they're overlapping. And when I finish one, I'm already in the middle of another. So I just jump right to that one and then do the same thing over and over again. I always have overlapping books. But in the past, when I have um, been caught in the middle of a, a listening slump, 
Um, that's normally a signal to me that I call it burnout. Um, sure. It's a signal to me that I need to take it a little more slowly. Um, usually I'll maybe take a couple of days off, watch some Netflix, get caught up on some shows. Uh, recently, I've been listening to TED Talks or a podcast, something that um, you know I'm still able to listen to multitask, but it's not an audiobook, just to kind of recharge myself before I, I dive back into audiobooks. And, you know, talking about uh, preventative measures is, is interesting because uh, that's something that a, a normal listener might not have to uh, deal with, but when you are working on a blog with specific types of content, or in my case, a podcast, um, like I can't really take too long of a break or else I'm not going to have anything to talk about on the show. That's right. It's the same thing. And that's why when you were talking about audiobook links, I was thinking of this because I have to plan out, you know, um, I'm going to review this book on this day and this book on this day. I have my little calendar and everything. And with shorter audiobooks, you get a quicker turnaround. So I'm able to post two or three reviews a week easily. But if I were to start, you know, an, an Outlander or um, a, a bigger book, I have to make sure that I have four or five or six reviews already scheduled you know, to auto post by themselves so that I can just focus on listening to this big book. And that's what I'm doing now because I have about four, my next four reviews are already scheduled. And I just started listening to Queen of the South, which is, I think, 19 or 20 hours. I'm not sure. It's bigger than, you know, an eight or a 10 hour book. Um, but I've, I've got that scheduled in my calendar so I can take the time and indulge in a, a bigger book. I've heard people um, address something like that in general when they would talk about their Goodreads reading challenge and how setting a, a lofty goal in your Goodreads reading challenge could hinder you from wanting to take on longer titles. And they were I think they were talking specifically about print, but this would apply to audio too. You and I actually, I think we both have a hundred set as our goal for, for the year. Mm -hmm. And um, I find myself, you know, I'm, I'm doing very well this year. I'm, I'm way ahead on my uh, goal. I'll, I'll easily get to a hundred unless something bad happens like a hurricane. That's interesting. You would, bring it up like that about having to post other reviews to allow you time to get through those longer books because that having a goal sometimes hinders a person's ability to take on those bigger titles and I have some titles in my library that are pretty 50 hours or so you know that I need to just sit down and do something like that with myself yeah definitely I mean I've, I've got let's see yeah, I think I've got the next six reviews, four, four to six reviews already scheduled. So I'm listening to Queen of the South now. And I mean, I, I like being able to indulge in a really big book as much as the next person, because you don't have to worry about book hangover for quite a while after that. But um, I have to make sure that my, my blog is on auto schedule. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to name anything in particular but you've you've uh talked and we uh, audiobook bloggers and podcasters and even authors and narrators know that the the narrator uh can make or break an audiobook sometimes even more than the more than the writing if a for performance seems phoned in or passionless then it can really hurt a, a story um, what are the types of things you look for when it comes to narration specifically? What for you makes a good narration? Characterization is the most, and you're going to get a different answer from everyone probably based on what they prize most in narration. But for me, it's characterization, the ability to provide good uh, character distinction, meaning uh, does the character do voice? I mean, does the narrator do voices? Are you able to tell one character from the next? 
do they do accents? Do they, you know, change their tone or or their pacing whenever a certain character is talking? Are you able to know who's talking, you know, without a name being mentioned? That's the most important to me. I would I would agree with that uh, as well because sometimes as I listen to a uh, a book, my mind does wander a little bit. When it comes back, if I can identify the character um, that is speaking based on the voice that has come from the uh, narrator, then that helps me get back in focus a lot easier. And I don't feel like I've missed as much when my mind was off in outer space. Right. Especially when, you know, you're listening maybe at night and you pause it and then the next morning you hit play. And if they were mid-sentence, you know what I mean? You might not remember exactly what was happening before you paused it the night before. You don't know who's talking. You have to orient yourself uh, uh, within the story again. Narration helps with that big time. And I guess another reason I ask that is because you, besides writing reviews on your blog, every now and again you'll tackle a question. And not too long ago you took on the topic of authors as narrators. Yeah. That one I was afraid. (laughs) See, I'm someone who never wants to step on any toes. So I was afraid that that was going to be a little controversial, but I tried to approach it in a respectful manner and just offer my opinion. And obviously, opinions are malleable. I'm not firm. You know what I mean? I'm not set in stone. With There's that. always exceptions. Exactly. Always. But where I stand now, I'm on the narrator side of that fence. I love narrators. I have a T-shirt that says I love narrators. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, I, I mean, I think leave it to the professionals. That's where I stand right now. I would I would definitely fall on that category, at least when it comes to fiction. I think authors re- reading their own nonfiction works sometimes is for the best because uh, an author is probably not going to struggle with uh, mispronunciations. And nothing takes me out of a book quite like hearing a word and knowing that it's being pronounced incorrectly. Right. And see, that's important. But the most important thing to me when hearing um, maybe a memoir or a biography that is narrated by the author, I want to hear the emotion and know that it's genuine. With a narrator, you can hear emotion in their voice if they're good, but it's not always going to be genuine. And especially when comparing it to a biography or a memoir, because they didn't experience that. They aren't reading their own work. But if it's um, an author narrating their own autobiography, the narration is going to be more genuine because they're telling their story. And of course, you know, when it comes to biographies, it, it really helps if the person who is reading, um, it, it can make a big, like you mentioned Betty White as in your article as being someone you thought did a really great job. And that's from decades of being a performer. Right, right. And I didn't consider that um, until you said it. But there again, my experience with nonfiction isn't that great. Um, Not that it was bad. I just mean it's not that vast. I usually stick to fiction. So Betty's memoir was one of the only nonfiction titles I've ever heard. So that was the only example that I could come up with from my experience. So I didn't really consider, um, you know, her acting history as as having influenced that. But I can definitely see how it would have. Well, you know, and I've read I've read a lot more fiction than you. It's funny. I used to listen to more fiction than to nonfiction. That has actually changed over the last two or three years. But um, when I think of, you know, an author being best equipped to narrate their own stuff. I'm speaking of like, I listened to um, The Death of WCW, which I've mentioned on this podcast several times. And I was so happy when the author announced that he was going to be narrating the audiobook because like I've heard audiobooks narrated by people who very clearly aren't wrestling fans. And so they don't they get a lot of like names wrong in particular, which is a little distracting if you 
if you're like, okay, like I listened to someone and they said the name Chris Benoit wrong. Oh no. Which, which is like, he was for a terrible reason. He was a national news Mm -hmm. story a decade ago. So the, it's not something, and I put part of that on whoever was producing it as well. I was so happy when someone with some familiarity with the subject matter was going to be narrating the the book, and I think that made it a lot better. And the fact that the author has experience in radio and podcasting and things meant that I was probably going to enjoy the experience since I enjoyed his work. But like you said, it's a little bit different for like, autobiography or biography than it is for like recounting a historical event from 1776 or even you know the history of world championship wrestling agreed and i heard um actually one of the other one of the only other nonfiction titles i've heard was crazy is my superpower you and i talked about it by uh, aj mendez brooks who was you know aj yep. lee um and i thought she did an absolutely phenomenal job narrating her own book. I mean, she would do a phenomenal job narrating any book. Honestly, I think she could put a lot of professional narrators out of business. And that, that is definitely an exception to the rule though. If uh, the listeners here are a little baffled by this uh, direction that the conversation uh, has gone in, it's probably something that I should disclose that both Jess and I are pro wrestling fans. (laughs) Yes, it's my guilty pleasure. So I want to talk to you next about a couple of the different things. Uh, these are all um, folded into audiobook worm promotions now, but when I first encountered you or when we first started talking about maybe doing something together, you hadn't actually done that yet, and these were just kind of things on your site. How did you get the idea for adopt an audiobook and how did you get that off the ground um it just like a lot of things it just sort of came to me all of my ideas start out as crazy ideas that i immediately reject and then they just kind of stay around in the back of my mind and i'm like well maybe i could do that but how and then i have to work through the how and then i try it out which is how audiobook form promotion started um i, I just kind of put it out there to see how it would take. And then it sort of took off. So um, it finally got big enough that I had to move it out of mama's house and it had to get a place of its own um, when it got its own domain and its own website. And the adoption program is a big part of that. I wanted to create sort of a, a central hub where there would be like a little go between between uh, authors and narrators and publishers who are looking for reviewers and reviewers who are looking for free books or great books to review. Um, it, it's a publicity service. I I, I guess it's a, a kind of like a concierge service too because I take over everything. All an author or publisher or narrator has to do is send me the information for their title and their promo codes uh, that they usually get through ACX. And I will uh, give that audiobook its own little place on my adoption page. And, you know, a a reader or reviewer comes along and scans the page. If they see something they like, they fill out the little uh, contact form at the bottom saying, I want to adopt this. And then I send it to them. They review it. They send me a link to their review. Voila. And uh, that's it. I mean, it's it's very straightforward. It's been very effective thus far. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, expanding it with more titles. I should note for the list for the listener's sake that I actually have done one of these for you. Mm-hmm. And it was a couple months ago. You actually had suggested uh, it a while ago and you know, life was getting in the way. But then a few months ago, you came to me and you said, I have this book and I think it would be right up your alley. And you sort of described it and you let me check it out. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. You know, it had been a while since I had written a review of any kind. 
thought, well, a friend of mine who usually edits my reviews is always pestering me to write more. So she has something to edit, something to work on. It was called Off the Grid, Living Blind Without the Internet. And like you said, it was a fairly straightforward thing. You sent me a code or you gifted me the book back when you could still do that. I listened to it in about a day and had the review done the next, you know, the next day. And uh, it was tweeted out and it was all handled by you. And the author noticed it and seemed to appreciate it. And, you know, I I hope that um, the authors have found this to be authors and narrators, too, and publishers to that extent have found this to be a worthwhile thing to have people do. And it's meant to be a service of convenience. So. Right now, um, most authors and narrators and publishers, um, they're having to go door to door, so to speak, or blog to blog, um, looking for reviewers, like manually, one by one. And most of them, especially I'm, from what I'm seeing, a lot of narrators are new to marketing their own work. They don't really know how to go about that. They find me and I say, don't worry, I'll take care of it all. Um, because I have a list of over 300 audiobook bloggers and reviewers who have signed up with me to hear about opportunities like this. So I send out one email and it goes to 300 plus people in the right target area instead of, you know, that author or narrator or whoever having to approach 300 separate people. Imagine how much time that saves. Oh, definitely. And, you know, I've just recently joined a few audio group books on Facebook and I see that a lot where they will say, I'm looking for reviewers for a uh, romance of this type and, and things like that when it would just be very easy to let you handle it and organize. You put your great organizational skills to uh, use because like you said, you have the knowledge that maybe they don't have and might not ever have any cause to acquire. You know what I mean? Like they might right. not have a reason to learn this stuff, but you already know it. And that's why going through you will be a, a real benefit to anybody looking to get their work out there as far as I'm concerned. Right. In certain cases, this being one of them, it is useful to have a middleman. Tell the listeners a little bit about blog tours and how that works. Um, you describe them on your website as being sort of a, a virtual equivalent to when an author does a book signing tour for a new release. So how do those come together? Right. Okay. So I didn't come up with the idea of virtual tours or blog tours. That idea has been around. What I did is I tweaked it to fit the audiobook format because there was no one else out there doing that exclusively. Like you said, a, a blog tour is meant to mimic a physical tour where you know, when a, an author goes on a physical book do tour, they go from city to city, from bookstore to bookstore, doing signings and readings and meet and greets. Um, the idea here is instead of going from city to city and store to store, you just go from blog to blog. So each day, your title, and not just your title, but you and your brand, meaning the author or narrator or publisher, are featured on several different blogs. And it's, you know, you can do interviews, you can do reviews. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of neat little features that I've come up with. Uh, audio excerpts is a big draw, I think. And um, I mean, it, it's about getting exposure and quality reviews in a timely manner. I like the feature that you have where you can uh, get um, interviews with characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I really think that's fun. fun. Yeah, that is that and character profiles. And it's really fun, too, whenever um, I I've seen an author have one character interview another. Oh, that does sound like a lot of fun. I see that you have gotten a lot of um, wonderful testimonials for um, some of your work. And I know that you probably have good things to say about a lot of these, but do any of the blog tours that you uh, have done really stand out to you? Well, the first one, um, for the same reasons that my first audiobook stands out to me, my first blog tour that I ever coordinated was for 
Omari and the People by Stephen Whitfield, and it was narrated by Kurt Simmons. And I'm actually organizing another tour right now for something else Kurt Simmons has done, uh, a book he has coming out called Vacation. But it was it all happened in a very kismet sort of way. I approached, this was last summer, I approached a couple of the traditional book tour companies, some of the bigger ones, saying, hey, I want to host for you. Um, do you ever have any opportunities you know, for audiobook listeners or are all the tours you do just for regular books? And they were very polite about it, but each of them emailed me back saying, no, we don't really ever have that many audiobook opportunities. We just aren't asked to do audiobook tours. And that kind of confused me because each day I was waking up and having, you know, a couple of uh, review requests from narrators and authors, like seriously, every day. And I was like, okay, well, if they are out there looking for reviewers, why aren't they using tours? And the only thing that I could figure was that it was because there wasn't any type of book tour service that was geared specifically for audiobooks. It seemed kind of like a disconnect between the audiobook community and the book community as far as marketing goes. And I thought, well, why can't audiobooks be marketed basically the same way books are? I mean, it would only take a little creativity. And that's sort of how um, my services came about. And I had a, I like to say I had a customer before I ever had a product because Stephen Whitfield approached me about doing a blog tour for him. And I said, oh, that's, you know, that's not really something I've ever done. I'm not really offering that. I wouldn't even know how. Um, I kind of politely turned him down. And then the next morning I got to thinking, well, why couldn't I do that? <laughs> and I put together a plan of action. I got back to him and I was like, yeah, you know what? I think I could. Let's see how it goes. And I approached some people, some bloggers, and um, they were all all for it. And everything just clicked. It just fell right into place. And um, so I did it again and again and again. And <laughs> uh, about 50 plus times later, here we are. 50 blog tours. That's really impressive and that you keep all that straight. <laughs> And like you said on your website, you know, the book community and the audiobook community have some similarities, but they also have a few differences. And those differences are why uh, doing a blog tour specific to an audiobook release, I think, fills a niche that obviously, as your experience bears out, wasn't being filled before. Right. Right. So, I mean, I just kind of saw it as stepping up to the plate, not in a, you know, a hero complex sort of way, but in a, well, somebody's got to do it and nobody else seems to be. So, you know, I'll, I'll step up. <laughs> of course, you don't just offer adopt an audiobook tours and blog tours. Um, you also have other things that a author, narrator or publisher could utilize other services. Yeah, I actually, I really, really love um, doing design services. I offer so many different design services and it's sort of my creative outlet. Um, I, I've gone basically my entire life thinking that I wasn't artistically inclined and that, you know, I didn't get uh, an ounce of creativity. Uh, my mother is a really talented artist, you know, as far as drawing and painting and that sort of thing. And I've never been great at that stuff. But this opportunity um, for web design and graphic design has shown me that I do have a little bit of artistic talent and uh, it's just expressed in a different way. And I design websites, I can design uh, logos, website headers, business cards. I mean, you name it, I've done it. And I have examples all on my website. I try to be a one-stop shop <laughs> for uh, any of my clients. If they come to me for one thing and I'll say, okay, well, you know, do you need anything else while, I, while we're already uh, having this conversation? A lot of narrators don't, I don't think that they... Um, realize all of the opportunities, all of the marketing opportunities that are open to them. A lot of narrators, you know, they'll have a website, but they won't have a newsletter. Or um, 
you, you know, they don't have uh, maybe a SoundCloud account or a Facebook page or, you know, things like that. I'm like, oh, you need this. You really need this. You have no idea how much you could do and how much easier you could market your services with these things. It's really cool. All of the different things that you uh, provide for authors, narrators, and publishers. If you go to uh, audiobookwormpromotions.com and you look at all the different services that Jess has available, it's all spelled out clearly. The rates are defined clearly, what you're getting. There's samples, there's testimonials, there's everything you could want if you're a publisher or a narrator or an author, especially if you're someone just starting out, if you're an author that like this is your first audiobook and it's self-published or you're a narrator and you've got like five titles under your belt and they're looking for a little bit more exposure. This is uh, Jess's website and her audiobook worm promotions are something that can really benefit you if you're fitting into that category and listening to this podcast. So as people are listening to this, this will be airing on the 14th of July. So do you have anything upcoming that you can plug? Um, yeah, okay. So right now we have some tours that are open. Anne of Green Gables, uh, a childhood classic that I, you know, I read in, I think, elementary school. It's now on audiobook from Post Hypnotic Press. And uh, we have a series tour coming up. It's the first three books of Anne of Green Gables. You can sign up to get uh, free review copies of those. Um, we have the uh, title I mentioned earlier that was narrated by Kurt Simmons, who is definitely one of my favorite narrators, not just because he's a phenomenal guy, but he's a phenomenal narrator. He is narrating Vacation, and I just reviewed that uh, a couple of days ago. I got an early copy of it. See, Casey, you probably know advanced copies in the audiobook world are almost unheard of. It's not yeah. like ARCs, you know, with regular books. But Kurt was able to get me an early copy of that, and I reviewed it. And now we're doing a, a audiobook blog tour for it. Um, so we've got that going on. I'm going to be um, reviewing uh, Learning Ally, which is an audiobook service that caters to um, individuals with disabilities that prevent them from being able to read print, be it a visual impairment, a learning disability, a physical disability, or what have you. I think that's a really, really neat service, and I'm excited to get to tell everyone about that. Yeah, I know Learning Ally well. Um, I they were they used to be uh, RFB and D, which was recording for the blind and dyslexic, and they did a lot of my college textbooks. Sounds like you've got a, a very busy next few weeks, and uh, that you're you wouldn't have it any other way. Absolutely, I love being busy. You've just been such a good friend of this podcast, promoting it, and you've been an absolute pleasure to have on and. We'll ha definitely have you on again in the future. Do you have anything that you would like to tell the listeners of the podcast uh, before we head out for the remainder of the show? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for listening. <laughs> and um, if you're interested in being a blog tour host or a, um, a reviewing host, uh, with Audiobookworm Promotions, you can head on over to audiobookwormpromotions.com or the audiobookworm.com. Um, it's pretty easy to sign up. You just kind of pick your what genres you're interested in and um, tell me where you would be posting reviews, and uh, I can hook you up with some free audiobooks. See, and that's really, um, I'm really glad you made it a point to say it like that because if you are not an author or narrator or publisher. You're just an audiobook listener and you're listening to this podcast because you love audiobooks so much that you also want to listen to a podcast about them. You know, a lot of people talk about audiobooks on a budget and things like that. But if you're willing to write reviews for Audible or on a blog or, you know, wherever you may post them, you can 
And if you're willing to try some new authors or new narrators or people who are self-published by choice, you can really accumulate a lot of books without spending any money. Oh, little teaser. Um, a couple months ago, we did a, an audiobook blog tour for Timekeeper by Tara Sam. That was a big deal. Um, it was very, very popular. And I mean, gosh, it had, I don't even remember how many tour hosts, but I ran out of review copies because it was such a hyped book. And I was so excited to be able to work with the publisher to put um, an audiobook blog tour together for that title. So that, that's just a little sneak peek of uh, the type of audiobooks that are available to you. And you can also check out the current list of Adopt and Audiobooks that are on on the Audiobook Promotions website and see if there's something you'd be interested in checking out. And if so, get in contact with Jess and she'll hook you up. Absolutely. Well, Jess, thanks again for doing the show. We really appreciate it. We'll have to have you on in the future, definitely to talk about more blog tours and uh, just more of what you're listening to. This show is as much about that as it is about anything else. Thanks again, Jess. We'll be back with more of the Talking Audiobooks podcast right after this. For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. And that is going to about do it for this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks. I want to again plug Jess's website, theaudiobookworm.com. That's all one word, theaudiobookworm.com. And her other website is audiobookwormpromotions.com. And that's where you can find out all about her promotional services, what she has to offer. At the audiobookworm.com, you can read her book reviews, her resource reviews, things like Audible, audiobooks.com, Scribd, TuneIn, Playster, and anything else that she has to offer over there. Um, if you're new to audiobooks, that's a good resource to look at so you can find the service that best meets your particular needs. She's very thorough in all of that at theaudiobookworm.com. You can follow her on Twitter at an audiobookworm. That's A N audiobookworm. And I'm sure she'd be more than happy to pick up an extra few followers and tell her that the Talking Audiobooks podcast sent you. Uh, like I said, she's going to be helping us in the future with some different things. And uh, there's going to be some interviews that we do in the future that are going to be because of her connections. And so. She has been and will continue to be a great friend of the show and I'm very happy with how that interview went. And like I said, her enthusiasm for audiobooks is infectious. With that, we are going to close the show for the week. We will be back next week. Maybe we'll have another interview for you then. Maybe we'll have a normal show. Maybe we will have something else. Who knows? Anything is possible when you listen to the Talking Audiobooks podcast. Except for Ken coming back as host, that is not possible. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Let me know what you think of it. And as always, have a good week and keep listening. Talking Audiobooks is a trademark of KenJoy Media, produced by KenJoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by Ken Joy, theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through EpidemicMusic.com. Visit our website at TalkingAudiobooks.com, follow us on Twitter at Talking Audio, follow us on Facebook at Talking Audiobooks, and subscribe to the Talking Audiobooks YouTube channel. 
Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors, like Audible.com, help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content. They don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you. And therefore, the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.